Hi everybody, this is Marlene with Miami Ghost Chronicles Stories of the Supernatural. And I hope you enjoy this new show, whether you're viewing it on the internet or listening to a podcast version of the episode. I do want to thank you for being part of my audience. You can also find links to videos or podcasts on MiamiGhostChronicles.com as well as where you can submit your story about any eerie experiences you've had, which I would love to hear about. Just go to the Submit Your Story tab. Please subscribe to our channel so that you receive notification of when we release a new show. And find us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. This is where I usually live stream and where I give you a behind-the-scenes look at locations where new episodes are being filmed at. I also tell you about all the interesting guests that will be appearing soon on Stories of the Supernatural. I hope you enjoy the show, and I think you are all wonderful. Hi everybody, this is Marlene with My Ghost Chronicle Stories of the Supernatural. How are you all doing today? I'm doing really, really good, and we're going to discuss one of the most interesting things that I know a lot of you love to hear about. It's about UFOs, and more importantly, I have a gentleman who's written several books about it. His name is Mac Maloney. Now, he is the best-selling author of numerous fiction series, including Wingman, Chopper Ops, Starhawk, and Pirate Hunters, as well as UFOs in Wartime, what they didn't want you to know. He's a native Bostonian. Uh, he received his Bachelor of Science degree in journalism at Suffolk University and a Master of Arts degree in film at Emerson College. To say that Mac has got lots and lots and lots of books, he does. But one of the two that I want to talk to him especially are one of the ones that he wrote, Beyond Area 51, The Mysteries of the Planet's Most Forbidden Top Secret Destinations, and also UFOs in wartime, what they didn't want you to know. So for all my conspiracy theorists, you're going to be happy about this. So how are you doing today, Mac? I'm doing good, Mylene. Thanks very much for having me on. On the contrary, my pleasure, my pleasure, totally. And I'm going to ask you, uh, Mac, what I ask all my guests, in this case, because we're looking at the UFO aspect. How did you uh, become interested in UFOs? Did you Have you ever had an experience or how did that happen for you? Um, I've, I've never had an experience, but when I was growing up um, in Boston as a, you know, as a kid, I just got fast, uh, became fascinated with UFOs and um, because at the time in the 50s, I'm, you know, I'm dating myself, but um, <laughs> there were a lot of like, um, you know, UFO reports in the newspaper. A lot of the a lot of the science fiction movies back then kind of mm -hmm. were UFO related, right. and um, I'm kind of, I'm kind of from a military family. I has not I have not been in the military myself, but a lot of my relatives, my father and brothers, uh, were in the military, and there were always lots of um, military books hanging around the house, and uh, especially airplanes. And I don't know for some reason that science fiction aspect and the aspect of you know reading a lot about aircraft as a little kid. It right. just came to this junction of UFOs. So I was always on the lookout for them. I read every book that I could get my hands on. And um, and then when I went on to start writing fiction books um, after college and such, um, I had lunch with my editor once, and, and I just happened to blurt out saying, you know, the thing about UFOs is people seem to see, see them more during war time than oh. peace time. And it, it just it had occurred to me, you know, years before, and it just was an idea of rolling around in my head. So he said, "Hey, that may that make a good book. Would you want to do that? Even though it's a nonfiction book." So I said, "Yeah, sure." Not realizing it's about you know ten times more work than a fiction book. You know, you have to do the research. Yes. And, you know, vet stuff and everything. But you know, I did it, and um, and that's what really got kind of got me into this aspect of what does how does the military deal with UFOs? You know, how have they really dealt with them? Let's say, you know, and. Um, right. I just find that fascinating. So, you know, that's how UFOs in war time came about. So let me ask you, when you were doing the research, what happened? You came across a lot of information that you were like, wow, or? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yep, exactly. And, and you know, I know that uh, people, you know, I've heard this before, but, yeah, you know, UFOs came into our kind of consciousness in the late 40s mm -hmm. with Kenneth Arnold's sighting. But, you know, UFOs have been around forever. You know, they have been around as long as recorded history. 
And when I started digging into, you know, stories about Alexander the Great seeing them and, uh, you know, people in, uh, um, you know, in, in the, the Middle Ages and in the Dark Ages, you know, if you interpret, if you just look at some of the documents from the Dark Ages, it, it, it's not a great leap uh, to realize that these people were seeing, you know, you, their lights in the sky were UFOs, what we would call UFOs. Right. And then, um, you know, all through World War One, fascinating in between the wars, lots of very interesting and unusual UFO sighted. And then during World War Two, the Foo Fighters, you know, I mean, people have written entire books about the Foo Fighters in World War Two. Um, so, um, yeah, and when it just kept accumulating this knowledge until my, my office was just like filled with, you know, stuff, you know, and... Uh, uh, and so then we put together, I think it's 170 different little stories about instances where the, the, you know, our military or someone's military has come in contact with UFOs in the 20th century. Right, because if you think about it, like you said, ancient civilizations or pre-airplane, in other words, they couldn't uh -huh. mistake it for an aircraft, in other words. Yes, right. And at that time, people were pretty familiar because they used it for seasons. They were pretty familiar with stars and comets. Mm -hmm. So right. for them, like you said, to make an observation of something that they couldn't identify, you know, then it begs the question, what was it that they were seeing? Right. You know, and as you said, you know, with the advent of, of airplanes, um, you know, at the, at the early part of the 20th century, now all of a sudden you have people looking up, the simple act of looking up and, mm -hmm. and, and looking at something flying over. Um, and also people up there flying around, seeing stuff that you know, that they know aren't airplanes. Uh, you, you have you almost have like more witnesses to see UFOs, you know, once we, you know, got off the ground. So, um, you know, and, and what that has developed into, and we talk about this a lot too in the book, is that, uh, you know, these days, uh, airline pilots and military pilots are our best witnesses of UFOs because, uh, especially military pilots, they've seen it all, you know. They, they've seen, they know what Venus looks like in the daytime. They know what... You know, the reflection of oil, uh, you know, um, uh, burning oil looks like uh, reflecting off the water. You know, they know what another airplane looks like. They know and they they, they look unusual, but they they know. And then when they see something that they don't know what it is, that's a UFO. And that is someone who is up there all the time. And if they don't know what it is, then, then it has to be something kind of strange. Well, you know, I belong to MUFON and I also belong to a local group here in Miami that gets together. You know, we'll, you know, move on, we'll come in and do presentation, but, you know, then everybody, you know, hangs out and talks. And there's a lot of, uh, like you said, trained observers, whether they're police officers or ex-military. Mm -hmm. And some of them will tell you, I saw this, but I was told or I was right. smart enough to know, like, shut up. <laughs> Don't talk yes. about this unless yes. you're always going to be known as that guy that saw whatever. Yes. Well, that's that's the problem both in the military uh, and and in air, airlines, uh, the airline industry is that. Let's say let's take the airline industry first. You know, I know a guy who um, flies for American Airlines. He flies from Chicago to Beijing twice a month over the pole, okay, and and back the same way. And um, he says we see stuff all the time. And he says, but you know, just the politics of his job is, if you go in and you report it. Next time you're up for a promotion or whatever, yes. and you're up against someone who hasn't reported something, that guy gets the job. You don't. Yes, you know? that's exactly and the military, right. same thing. The military pilots will talk about it among themselves, but they never bring it to higher authority because they know, once again, when it's promotion time, whatever, that's going to hold you back if you're you know, competing with someone who yes. hasn't made UFO reports. So, so you know, the, uh, our uh, two groups of the best UFO, you know, witnesses are kind of, uh, you know, they, 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 they've been clamped down, let's say. You know, they can't sure. talk about it yeah. um, with the risk of their careers. Yeah, most of them will only come about and talk about it once they've retired. Right. And it's like, okay. Uh, and, and because also it's more and more people are talking about it. Mm -hmm. As in, but still, yeah, it has that stigma. If you have some type of responsible position, like you said, you know, they're not going to come out and tell you, oh, because what you said, but they'll make the other choice. Right. Uh, and, right. And, and this is the thing that you think about it. Okay, let's say, yeah, some people were mistaken, even if they're trained observers, mm -hmm. uh, or they're lying. But there's been so many sightings that what? Right. Everybody's lying and hallucinating? Right. They all can't be hoaxes <laughs> and everyone can't be lying. You know, I mean, it's as simple as that. And all it takes is one, just one UFO sighting to be true. You know what I mean? Exactly. All it takes is one, and then they might as well all be true. 
um, obviously something is out there. People see things that they can't explain, as we were talking a little bit off air. You know, they don't mm-hmm. necessarily have to be the green men from Mars. Yes. You know, but there's something that we don't understand. And the question that I have, you know, both, you know, writing about it and as I mentioned before, we're running, we have a radio show we talk about it, mm-hmm. is that a lot of people think the military, U.S. military know what UFOs are. Um, I don't believe they do. I don't think they know anything more than we yes, do. Yes. They have more evidence of it. They definitely have more evidence that they exist. But I think they're just as much in the dark as we are. Mm-hmm. And um, and I, and you know that's kind of fascinating in a way because they get they get accused of knowing, you know, what this is. But if they knew, it's the greatest discovery in you know the the history of humankind. And and they would be holding this back from us. Why? You know so. I just think I know that they have more evidence of them than we do, but I don't believe the U.S. military, any military, knows what UFO, UFOs are for sure. And, you know, and I'm glad you brought that up, Mac, and I want to explain why, because everybody, of course, thinks that the secrecy that, you know, whether it's because we've traded information with the, mm-hmm. with the ETs, you know, hybrid. Sometimes right. I think, like, exactly like what you said, that sometimes maybe the reason why they have held back on actually admitting it is because then they would have to admit of how much they don't know. Mm -hmm. And that makes, talk about people wigging out, because maybe they're thinking, well, if the government knows about it, they'll handle it. And if they ever came out and they would say, well, who are they? Or what are they? We don't know. Where do they come from? We don't know. Everybody'd be like, what do you mean you don't know? And sometimes I think that it's like you said, it's not what they know, it's what they don't know as to why they haven't come out and and we talked about that in December they kind of made an admissions that there was a program that was Mm -hmm. being funded for research into UFOs as in we don't know what their origins are and that was that was everybody was like huh they actually admitted to that see that's the thing too is that because Project Blue Book you know supposedly was closed at the end of the 60s and um, at at least that's when they stopped funding it and Mm -hmm. all that time up until last December the U.S. military and the U.S. government would say, we no longer look into UFOs. We don't have any kind of a program looking into UFOs. And then it turns out that they were lying, that they did have this program, that they were funding it. And and so it's kind of like, well, and once again, when that happened, I thought, and I know a lot of people out there thought, you know, why now? Why is this trickling out? You know, why, why um, you know, I, I can tell you a really quick story that's sure. connected to this, okay? On our radio show, I'm, I'm lucky because a lot of the people I just happened to grow up with in Boston turned out to work for, you know, the government agencies. And I, lo- I know a lot of people say that they know people work for the CIA and FBI and so on, but we really do. And they're on the show. Okay. And, um, you know, and they'll talk to us. They're under assumed names and so on. And um, this one guy who works with uh, the FBI um, was sent to a it's sent to Washington Washington last summer to take part in this kind of workshop where and they do them three or four times a year where they'll have someone from the State Department, someone from the military, someone from the FBI, some from the CIA, someone from here, there, everywhere. They get together in a room, they give them a problem, and they say, "How would you solve this problem?" And usually, the problem is something like, "What if terrorists took over a cruise ship? You know, what if terrorists took over JFK Airport?" Right. And then they, you know, they kind of talk about solutions, let's say, okay? And he's been to a number of these things. Last year's question was, what would your response be if the, Uf- if the United States recovered a flying saucer, a UFO, right? And, and when they announced the question, everyone just looked at each other and they said, you've got to be kidding me because this is like so yeah. not how these things go, you know? Mm-hmm. And he says that was really surprising. And he, and he thought to himself, the first thing he thought was, Wow, are they are they getting us ready for something? You know, right. because that's what these things are for to kind of get you ready for mm-hmm. the unexpected. You know, so uh, yeah, so he told that story on our show, and we we're like, oh boy, yikes! Of and course. Then, this, then the video comes out in December. So, right, and this is the thing, like you said, they, he's been you, you used to all these examples of uh, catastrophes or what mm-hmm. if, like things that could happen in other yeah, words like a nuclear plant blowing up right. or being taken over by terrorists or yeah you know, those kind of you know almost like movie scenario mm-hmm. things but exactly. when they, but they had never used anything haven't they would never mention ufos or anything and now all of a sudden boom here they are doing this yeah it's almost like okay and, and i imagine um 
makes you think, like you said, is there something that they're anticipating is going to happen shortly? And they're saying, hey, we cannot keep up this. We don't know what it is. Right. Or because if not, it's going to be worse. So we have to start. Even though a lot of people say, well, you know, Hollywood has conditioned people. You know, I mean, I know that originally, like you said, back in the 50s and 60s, it was the Cold War. And, uh, you know, a lot of those UFO mm-hmm. movies came out. And then we had the third, you know, the Close Encounters movie. And then it's progressed since there. So a lot of people will say, well, you're acclimated. We are, but right. we're not. Because it's right. always been in the realm of never proven. Right. Well, see, that, that's the thing. And once again, you know, we're talking about stuff that, that we talk about on the uh, show all the time. And, and it's like, I blame the uh, media for the state of affairs right now. Because, like you said, look at how many movies, mm-hmm. big blockbuster movies, have to do with, like, ETs and stuff. You start yes. with Close Encounters. You start with War of the Worlds. You know, these mm-hmm. really good movies. Independence Day. I mean, you know, yes. um, and it's about E.T. And it's about... You know, us making contact with you know some other you know life form, okay? But when but when these things happen, like especially when the video came out in December mm-hmm. of that incredible thing that and you can hear these pilots talking about it and everything. Right. And then as soon as you know it went back to, I was watching ABC in, this morning, and uh, you know they showed the video and and right away the news, the people behind the desk started making fun of it. Oh, that's the of Millennium course. Falcon. That's from Star Wars. And it's like, wow, you don't think people would be interested in an intelligent discussion about this? You know, they go see all the movies. They want to know these things. Of course. But the media just brings in that ridicule factor, you know, and and, and it kind of wrecks it all. Well, and and I want to ask you also, because like you said, that that uh, that there's a spike sometimes in sightings when there's war. And and I've also Mm -hmm. heard that there's more sightings around certain military installations. Mm hmm. Did you find that in your research? Is that accurate? Yes. Oh, definitely. Yeah. I mean, um, the second book that I did was um, Beyond Area 51, because when you sign a, a book contract, you, you they always have second refusal on your next book, you know, so okay. I had to come up with like kind of the, a, a different kind of idea, you know, so right. we just said, let's, let's, let's talk about all these Area 51 type bases around the world, every type, every secret base like that, except Area 51. Okay. And so... And we found them everywhere. I mean, there was, I think there's 15 or 16 examples in the book. And, you know, they're in England, they're in France, they're in Russia, they're up in Alaska, they're in China, they're in Australia. And all these, like, really, really kind of uh, scary secret places that, you know, the U.S. military and other militaries are doing this stuff in. Mm -hmm. And every single one of them has some kind of UFO history attached to it. Every single one of them. Right. And, and so it's like, it's the chicken and the egg, you know, what came first, first. you know what I mean? Why, why do these secret bases have UFO histories? Uh, and, and some of them are just really, really way out. Um, but um, uh, so, you know, who knows? And that, that also leads to the thing where I get this idea that the UFO, the people, whoever are controlling UFOs, I get this feeling they're looking in on us. They're right. observing us. They're Maybe they're time travelers, time tourists coming back and seeing how history is made or whatever. But some of the stories about, like, the British uh, Area 51 and mm-hmm. Russia's Area 51, they're just fascinating. Well, and this is the thing that, because if you look at it, like, Stephen Hawking, who recently passed away, he kind of like, I don't know if you remember, he kind of said, you know, humans uh, are so hot in pursuit of that proof of mm-hmm. ETs coming here to Earth. But we have to be careful because we might be on the short end of the stick because obviously, yes. as far as technology is concerned we're inferior and usually that formula the inferior get picked on and it it makes you wonder are they observing us are they monitoring us are they have they been interjecting there or giving us some type of technology maybe whether it was in the past or now maybe there's more than one of them and um, there's a good chance of that too sure you know it's like the native americans you know looking you know out on the ocean in the 16, 1500s or whatever and say, hey, what's that out there? You know, is that, it looks like a big ship. I wonder what that's about. I mean, maybe that's what's happening to us. You know, just slowly but surely we start seeing evidence of these things. And as Stephen Hawking said, you know, you might not want to invite them in, you know what I mean? Right. Because look what happened to the Native Americans. So that could very easily happen to us. And, um, oh, sorry. About that. It's okay. Mac, do you think, do you think that's a, an accurate concern as far as um, 
that we don't know if we're going to be treated uh, what's fairly nicely. Well, just the way things seem to go here on Earth, if we can, if we can take what's happened here on Earth as an example, uh, I think Stephen Hawking's warning, I think, it, you know, has some credence to it because any any civilization, any kind of an intelligence who has the ability to come here, exactly, must be of a higher technology, and 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 that goes back to you know what I was saying before is that I don't think the U.S. military knows as much as we think they know, right? Uh, because um, this whole idea that, you know, we have, uh, you know, I mean, up until just a few years ago, they were launching the space shuttle from Cape Canaveral. That's like, you know, uh, trying to launch a dump truck into orbit. And, and, and some people believe we have anti-grav machines out in Nevada. You know, it doesn't make sense to me. You know, I think that anything that comes here, uh, you know, uh, will have a much higher technological um, level than us. And they could take us over, you know. I mean, it's as simple as that. It could happen. Right. And and I'm going to reference Star Trek. Why not? You mm -hmm. know, where the prime directive was don't interfere. And a lot of people, I think, mistake being technologically advanced with they're nice or fair. And that doesn't always. Right. Because we're basing it on human beings as far as our morals or whatever. And we're talking mm -hmm. a different species who may right. not understand or care but but if if this if all these things that we've been seeing over the years and and I mean over you know thousands of years really, if they were all part of the same thing, if they're all part of this other intelligence that we don't know about, um, we don't know about them. They know a lot about us. Oh yeah, because they they've been in the they've been in our skies for all these years. And 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 another kind of odd thing too is that people think UFOs try to hide from us. You know that they try to be stealthy and everything, but they don't because people see them all the time. Yes. You know, people see them all the time. I mean, they, they act in a peculiar way, no doubt about it. But, um, you, you know, I mean, look at the Hudson Valley sightings where like literally hundreds of thousands of people saw, you know, these huge triangles going down the Hudson River for, for, for days, weeks at right. a time. I mean, that's not hiding. No, of course. And then, of course, the explanations that, because of course, every the first thing everything everybody thinks is that a military. No, that's not military. You know, mm -hmm. and no no explanation is really given as far as what what the origin is, and right. it just of course time goes by it and you know nothing, and, and and I know for people that have actually had that firsthand experience of it, mm -hmm. it's mind boggling because it's like your reality shifts that goes on its side because right. it becomes yeah. from the possibility of to it does exist. Right. Uh, the closest I ever came to a UFO sighting, and, and uh, believe me, I was like really excited. We live um, in Massachusetts, and we, we actually live on an island, a barrier island, mm -hmm. and there's a lot of like sand dunes and so on and so forth. And we were out at dusk one night looking at the waves, and we looked out to the south, and over the marshes came, I could see two separate groups of lights. Uh, green, amber, red, white, blinking off and on. I'm going, wow, look at this. And, they, and it's like they were low to the ground. And they were probably a mile and a half away. And they're coming right towards us. And and I just remember thinking, I'm, I'm actually going to see a UFO because this is this is right. what like everyone describes them as, you know. And they went over our head and they were two medevac helicopters heading for a hospital in the city where we live. Um, and it was like, I, up until that second where I realized what they were, I would have bet a thousand dollars that I'm finally having my UFO sighting. It was like, I, I was so excited. I was so excited. So, like you say, like if if you you know people, and I've talked to people who actually have one, they're not helicopters. These things are like really crazy, and and it changes your life in a way. It it, it I think it's special in a way if you have a UFO sighting, you know. And I think some people will see them. A lot of times they appear to people who don't believe in them. But if you're out looking for them, you're never going to see one, you know, yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. And also what we just, I'm gonna ask, because before we go into what we were discussing before is how do they travel, do you think that the fact that we're actually looking to Mars, do you think that might have something to do with why maybe they've sped things up as far as disclosure about <clears throat> ETs? Well, it could be. I mean, you know, um, 
again on on uh, you know we've had people on our show we've talked to people where they say that there are secret bases on the moon secret bases on Mars mm-hmm. uh, all, all kind of like ancient structures on Mars and everything but the thing is is that uh, like for the moon for instance there's there's been a Japanese satellite that has been orbiting the moon now for several years it's in a very low earth orbit you can go on their website and mm-hmm. see the live transmission of the moon it's covered every every square inch of the moon okay and okay. anyone can look in on it there are no secret bases there because you know this satellite would have seen them exactly uh, same, same thing with mars you know mars now we have so many things orbiting mars taking pictures you know if there was some kind of real sign of civilization there mm-hmm. we would have seen it you know i would love for the face on mars to be true oh, but sure. you know but but we would have seen it and and you can't expect uh, you know, I mean, uh, you, the U.S. has satellites orbiting the moon and Mars. Russia has satellites. China has satellites. Mm-hmm. You can't you can't imagine all these people who are basically day to day enemies, uh, you know, our antagonists to all of a sudden come together in a conspiracy and say, OK, you know, we have yes. all these issues, but we're not going to talk about that fortress on Mars, you know. Yeah, exactly. It, that just wouldn't happen, you know. So but on the other hand, if we uh, it looks like we're going to Mars soon, you know, hopefully. Um, sooner than later, maybe whoever's ever, whoever is looking in on us say, okay, now they're really kind of... Um, that's what I was going with. Yeah, I, because yeah. I was thinking, you know, going to the moon is like, well, that's a satellite, you know, it's yeah, off, right. the, yeah, off sure. the earth. You know, they're kind of like in their same neighborhood. Right, right. And personally, I, I, I that f- what they said that they thought that they had seen what was or could be water or frozen water. To mm-hmm. me, I was like, oh, I think we're going to be the first Martians. Um mm-hmm. And yep. like maybe that's what they were waiting for all along. Like, okay, now they're going off planet, right? And we need that's, to. I don't want to say see, interfere, but. Well, we need to, maybe there's some reason then that they have to make their presence known that we've actually you know have the ability to go to another planet. I mean, you know, a man, uh, you know, a humans actually going to another planet, which. If, you know, Elon Musk, you know, if his dream comes true, you know, this is going to be something that's going to be happening, you know, pretty soon. You know, mm-hmm. it's not going to be happening in, in 2050. It's going to be happening in the late 2020s or even sooner. Right. Uh, NASA came out the other day, said that um, as far as their long range explorers and uh, telescopes, space telescopes, space telescopes, they expect to find some kind of alien life by 2025. Wow. Um, you know, this would be that there's a satellite going up called the James Webb Space Telescope that will is actually been be able to key in on these planets where you know we've discovered other planets going around stars and see if there's carbon dioxide and carbon monoxide in the atmosphere and that would indicate that there's some, some kind of industry or whatever. Mm-hmm. You know, so this is going this is something that's going to be coming from a scientific point of view. You know, pretty right. soon. It's, it, it's not the UFO landing on the White House lawn, but it's 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 kind of scientific proof. Oh, absolutely. And this is, and we were talking also that another aspect, because we always think of extraterrestrials as in UFOs or whatever. Mm-hmm. We think of it as well, how we measure distance, let's say interplanetary or, you know, in light years, et cetera. And if, right. But what if they're coming in inter, interdimensionally? Right. Uh, because they have the technology or because of the forms that they have, which allows them to do that. Right. I know some people would be like, what? <laughs> but, but see, that makes more sense. You know, yeah. it, it makes more sense that they, they that they might be somehow traveling in time. Mm-hmm. They're able to move in time because, you know, we are here on this this planet and this kind of lonely little solar system out in a very lonely part at the very edge of the gal- uh, Milky Way galaxy. Okay, we're not special at in the least. Oh no, you know. Um, so, you know, and, and like I say, we put trillions of uh, billions, hundreds of billions of dollars to put the space shuttle up in orbit. That's like the most complicated piece of machinery ever in history. OK, you know, for someone to go from, you know, here to there. I mean, mm-hmm. the distances, even just to get to Alpha Centauri, the closest other star, oh, yeah. you'd have to like travel like thousands of years to get there. Right. So traveling the way we travel is not the way people are traveling in space. We just no. don't know how. Exactly. And I I do think that there are what they call either rips or portals sometimes Mm -hmm. between dimensions that account sometimes for. Right. Yeah. I mean, uh, you know, Einstein said that it's it's you can bend space. I Mm -hmm. mean, it's it's gravity. Gravity is proof that you can bend space and, um, you know, and wormholes and so on. And then I read the other day that, 
you know, that now they think that, um, you know, a human being could actually survive going through a black hole. They always thought you'd be right. Eric the Papa now and said, well, it might not be that bad. And, you know, mm -hmm. what's on the other side of those things? So, um, you know, it's I, I'm glad that, you know, we live when we live right now, you know, because we know more now about all of the stuff than anyone ever did, obviously. But we're also progressing to it faster and faster and faster. So sometime in the next decade, you know, everything might just change. Right. Yeah. I mean, for all we know, like I'm going to go back to Star Trek, you know, the beam me up, Scotty, where you basically your molecules are shot across and you reassemble. Yeah. At the yeah. other point B, and it's like, mm -hmm. why not? Just because we don't know how to do it, but that would that would be an easy way of uh, going light years and right. distance wise. There's there's a thing I was reading about the other day. It's called um, it's an Einstein theory called spooky action at a distance. Okay, okay. which is a very cool you know title. Mm -hmm. And what they found out was that if you take a um, and and believe me, I'm no egghead at all. Okay, I'm a <laughs> I'm a product of the Boston school system. Okay, so I really, you know, but they say if you take an atom, a hydrogen atom, and you split it in pot and in two, okay, okay, and you're able to keep one on Earth and you're able to put one out light years out into space, if you were able to kind of take a little hammer and hit the uh, one half of it here on Earth, it would start to vibrate, and the one out in space would start to vibrate as well. You know, no matter how far away they are separated, they will act the same. Okay, spooky action is a difference, which is such a great title for something, a book, a movie, or something. But yes. Einstein proved that, okay? So what does that tell you? That tells you that yeah. what you have here on Earth can happen light years away if, if the atoms line up. That is so interesting. That is so interesting. And what about what do you think about the idea that at some point they might have seeded us, of course, right. thousands and thousands of years ago. And basically what they, you know, is, including all those ancient sightings are, they're kind of checking on the on the experiment. How things are going? <laughs> yeah. How uh, things are going, right? Yeah. Well, they're not going too good. Maybe that's why they're not here. But, um, it, yeah, I mean, I read all of Von Dynekin's books when I was mm -hmm. in uh, Eric Von Dynekin's when I was in college, and I just couldn't get enough of them, you know, right? Because there just seemed to be so much proof that that something happened here. It, it looks like, um, you know, about ten thousand years ago, something that we really can't explain, and you just see these remnants of it. And, um, mm -hmm. it, you know, you know, is there a chance that there are other people here, other intelligences here before, you know, we kind of became, quote unquote, civilized? I think so. Right. There are places in South America. There are places in Turkey. These fortresses that are built on the top of mountains that yes. are almost the size of, you know, as high as Mount Everest, you know. And, and basically we're talking about cavemen. Right. How do cavemen, you know, you know, you know, um, raise uh, piece uh, blocks of of granite that are like six hundred tons? You know, mm -hmm. couldn't do it today. These things, these places exist. You know, um, and 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 some of the things that happened to the Sumerians, you know, the first people who had writing and so on. You know, exactly. they they believe in people coming down from outer space and helping them. So, you know, seeding us, I don't know, visiting us. I'm thinking, you know, if they're out there, there's a good chance they did visit us. Well, and and, and then you think exactly like what you described. Let's, it's like, okay, we're going to erect this in the most difficult location that there you could, especially when we're not talking any type of machinery, uh, to to do this work. Like you said, we're going to do it in the most difficult locations to erect a structure, mm -hmm. and they would do it. Uh, and some of these ancient civilizations, uh, where manpower was needed, usually for survival as in whether it was crops or hunting and then they would right. still use these like you said in uh, the nazca lines or all these places that you know that the manpower would have had to be incredible to produce these things taking mm -hmm. years so in other words they were pulling manpower from usually other activities that would be needed right to make sure that they had food and survival right so exactly. otherwise it was very important for them to do this right it, it see that's the thing is that well, okay, you, you need a certain amount of manpower, as you say, to grow the crops, to feed, you know, your civilization, whatever. You're the, you're the Incas, the, the Aztecs, mm -hmm. you know, whoever, uh, the Egyptians or whatever. So you, you are taking, you know, manpower, man hours. I mean, to, to uh, there's, there's a place in Turkey called, I think, Gobi, Tobeki or something. Mm -hmm. I probably have that wrong. 
but it's this massive fortress up on a mountain that is just like you need oxygen to go up there practically. Right. What were cavemen doing building this stuff up there? Why, you know, once again, if they did it, why was it so important to them? Or if someone else did it, you know, why? Um, down exactly. in, especially down in South America, there's some of them down in South America, they're just like they're so far out. Like I say, you couldn't build them today, you know, yet right. these people did it. So, um, Oh, yeah, if you I, gave him the tools that supposedly these civilizations had and said, go build this. Yes, it right. It would be like, right. yeah. <laughs> How could we do it these days? How could you get a 600-ton piece of granite shaved perfectly to fit mm -hmm. into something on a plateau in Peru that's like, you know, 7,000 miles, uh, 7,000 feet above sea level? Yes. How do you do that? Exactly. You know? I, but they did it. And it's – and. Uh, even when you look at some of these locations that, uh, and I'm going to use, even though they're not civilizations that really didn't have any type of connection as far as we know, but they were mm -hmm. building very similar structures as an either right. pointed or pyramid or, you know, aimed at the heavens. And then you look at Stonehenge that, you mm -hmm. know, they're discovering all these other, that, that these pieces of stone weighed tons. Right. And there was no technology as far as we know. Right. For that time period, that how would they have done this, or why? Why? The question is why? Why would why? you do that? You know, yes. it, but but it must have been it must have been the, their you know their a priority because it, it had to come over, you know, creating the food, the hunting, and so on and so forth. This this was a priority for these people, mm -hmm. but uh, but and, and not just in Stonehenge, but all around the world about ten thousand right. years ago. Why were they doing it? You know, what was the you know, why was it so important to everybody? Um, right. And, and and there's no, I don't know, you know, is it connected to UFOs? Is it, who knows? But it's, yeah, I find it fascinating. I find it fascinating that, you know, science these days, I mean, archaeologists, e e and people who study archaeology in Egypt, they don't want to hear about any of that stuff. But there's a good, there's, there's proof that, like, at one point, water started wearing away the Sphinx. Water started wearing, you know, Exactly. They don't have any. I mean, it, 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 the water was in uh, Egypt fifteen thousand years ago. So is the Sphinx that old? You know, I mean. Exactly. Once this stuff, once this kind of stuff, you know, is able to go into the scientific realm without any kind of a ridicule factor, that's when I think we start to get answers. And you and you said it right there without the ridicule and. and I, I mean, believe me, I, I believe that science needs to be there. I, I just have a problem when, with some of the scientists that don't leave the door open for other possibilities just because it hasn't been proven yet. Right, right. Well, well once again, it's politics. You know, it's, it's almost like what you're saying with military pilots and airline pilots is that, you know, you're not going to advance far yes. if, you, if, you, if you want a grant for, a, you know, a million dollars. Oh, yeah. You know, for of UFOs not. in Egypt, you know. But at some point, and it's not going to. And the sad thing is, it's not going to happen in our country. This is, you know, what what I feel. Mm -hmm. it, it's not going to happen in the U.S. The person who figures out, you know, why they built these uh, fortresses, you know, on top of these mountains in South America, the person who figures out, you know, what UFOs are or whatever, it, they're going to be in China. They're going to be in yeah. India. Uh, they're going to be in these places who don't have this kind of idea that, oh, we can't talk about that. We can't study this. Right. You know, kind of like uh, let it all hang out and see where it and, – and that's too bad because, you know, I think uh, time has kind of passed us by as far as that kind of stuff. I think that it's it's the people who discover what UFOs finally are. I think it's going to be someone in Asia and not here. Right. And I – you know, and I tend to think sometimes that there might be more than one as far as – I don't think that – it, you know, because everybody's thinking, okay, well, it's one, but what if there has been more than one? What mm -hmm. if there's a, yeah, what if there's like, what do they call a federation? I'm just using that word loosely right. as sure. far as uh, <laughs> what right. if there's a bunch of them well, that have they, been observing us. The, the people who came to the New World here, you know, in 1492, the first people who came, well, you know, were the Spanish, but then the French came, mm -hmm. the English came, the Portuguese came. I mean, all, all different kinds of people came and they all had different kinds of agendas too you know so why would we think that you know that the the aliens that finally come here they're all going to be in silver suits and you know in exactly. flying saucer shaped craft you know it, there's a good chance that there's a lot of them out there and you know at some point i don't know if that's true if there's if there's a lot of them out there then it's inevitable that that, that they're going to make themselves known and come here it just it depends on when right and then you know you have all these other stories about 
people, you know, detailing abductions, whether it's once or systematically, Mm -hmm. um, that uh, as far as, you know, they've been even given lie detector tests and Mm -hmm. they've passed it. In other words, which means that what they're saying, they believe it to be true. Right, right. Okay. Uh, I I can tell you what I think about that. And, and, um, And I came upon this kind of, it, right after um, writing UFOs in one time, where we I was on a radio show and we were discussing exactly that, and where people who had abduction experiences uh, would be hypnotized. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a uh, doctor at Harvard, uh, Harvard University near where we live, um, uh, Dr. John Mack, I think his name was, mm-hmm. and he was one of the first people. Uh, uh, there was a, two or three people who were doing this. They would take abduction people, people who claimed they were abducted, and they would hypnotize them, and they would kind of just write down everything they said. Right. And they wouldn't let anyone else know. They wouldn't let. They wouldn't let. There was some stuff they did kind of write books about, but there was some stuff that they kind of kept to themselves. Mm-hmm. And one of them was that a lot of abductee people say, as strange as it sounds, it's they say that the people that the beings that abducted them had tattoos, had tattoos. Okay? Really. And for a long time, John Mack's uh, family, um, the people who kind of inherited all this research after he passed away, uh, they kept that to themselves. But then it finally did get out there. And um, there's a couple other gentlemen who were doing the same thing. Mm -hmm. So what you have is you have people who have never met each other. Let's say someone in Florida and someone in Washington State, opposite end of the country, having an abduction experience and both saying – that the aliens had, or the the people abducting them, had tattoos. See, that's something you don't make up. You know what I mean? That's exactly. Something, you know, that's that, and I found that very strange. And I thought, you know what? There must be something to this because why would all these people say this without knowing everyone else is saying it? Um, so you know, it's an unusual um, thing. It really is. It is an unusual thing. Um, so I, I tend to believe, you know, um, you know, we have abductees sometimes on our show and. You know, a lot of times people want to kind of discount what they've gone through, mm-hmm. but they went through something, you know, I don't know who knows what it is, might not be little green men from Mars, but they went through something because they all have this kind of common thread that goes through the stories. And it isn't like they've heard, you know, these particular things before. Well, you know, I'm a hypnotherapist and I was one for many years. I stopped doing it because I just didn't have enough time. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, a lot of people think that because of whether it's recovered memories or regression or whatever, it's like, oh, uh, you know, in some cases, yes, there have been hypnotists that unfortunately have led the person under hypnosis, which, by Mm -hmm. the way, that's there's a big misconception because people think that when you're hypnotized, you're like totally unaware of what's going on. On the contrary, you're super aware. Of okay. everything that's going on. It's just you're really super relaxed. Right. And in that super relaxed state is when you're able to sometimes see what your critical mind doesn't let you see. Right. Uh, because the, the belief is this. And normally your mind will do everything it can to protect you from going insane. In other words, okay. if you witness or you saw something, and everybody's going to be different. Some people handle things better than others. It will shield you with amnesia. In other words, Mm -hmm. uh, or not the full thing, because Mm -hmm. at all costs, the mind wants to protect the mind. Right. Uh, Sometimes a little bit of time will go by and then people will start having weird dreams. In other words, the mind knows if and when that person can uh, be aware of it and be okay. And then there's sometimes you never recover those memories because the mind finds that if you ever became aware of whatever happened or transpired, you would not be able to handle it. Everybody's different. So you, uh, you'd be surprised at what people will remember uh, when they're totally relaxed and Mm -hmm. they're totally aware. And you're not, you know, you're not of course let it anywhere uh, as far as recovering certain memories of certain things. And in a, and in a way where, you know, if the hypnotist is trained the right way, where they go what's called is into observer mode. In other words, it might be something a little bit traumatic, but it's almost like if you're looking at a movie, even though you know it's you, the hypnotist can pull you back and have you look at it like if you're looking at a movie so that you don't, like, lose right. it. In other words. I was, you know, it's funny because I was hypnotized once because I hate flying. I, okay. I write aviation books. You know, I mean, my 
uh, the Wingman series that you've mentioned earlier on. It's about a jet fighter pilot, you know. And <laughs> but I I don't like flying at all. So I got hit. I tried to. I had to take a trip to California once. So mm-hmm. I went to a hypnotist and hoping that they would help me. And um, I was there about five minutes. Fell asleep in the chair. And and woke up like forty minutes later with a bill for seventy five dollars. And I said, "Did I did I we, am I hypnotized? My cure?" He says, "No, you just fell asleep." But I just kept going. It was like the most expensive nap. Well, you know took. what? I've, if you relax somebody, I've had clients that have actually snored, but they're awake because you ask them, and there's stuff that because if you get somebody super super relaxed, they get to the point mm-hmm. where they can't. It's you're so relaxed that you can't even verbalize, but I can yeah, okay. make you make signals with your finger. And as a matter of fact, that's a very good indicator that your your subconscious is listening. Mm-hmm. You know, where I, you ask for yes or no, and then you get, but the person almost like, it's really hard for them to talk because they're so relaxed. Okay. But yeah, I, I've, I've handled clients like that, that they had to travel. And every time they got on a plane, it was like, Oh, the worst. The plane, yeah. an elevator, you yeah. name it. Yeah, yeah. It was. It, it, it's planes with me because I, I write about them all the time and I kind of know how the sausage is made, if you know what I mean, you know. <laughs> okay. And I'm telling you, it's just barely a theory that those things are up there, you know. It really is. And and, and I thought that you know, hyp- hypnosis was going to cure me, but I, mm. I took the trip two weeks later. I was terrified the whole way. Right. So well, it, well it, he didn't it, address it. Not... If you fell asleep, it's like he relaxed really well, which is great, yeah. which is yeah, Too much. but he kind of like, but uh, no, the, and let me ask you, did you, do, you never actually have had a bad experience. It's just, you're saying like, in this case, ignorance would have been bliss, but since you're not ignorant, do you think that's, have you always been yes. afraid to fly? Uh, well, the first time I ever went up in a plane was, I was a teenager and we were, um, uh, went up on a, like a sightseeing thing and a little Piper Cub, mm-hmm. you know, and I was like really looking forward to it. And, and the engine stopped in flight, if you can believe it. I can still see the propeller just, boom, that, That's stopped. a good reason and, to be afraid. You know, yeah, and they started it up right right away. And um, and then we landed and everything was good. But I, 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 I got a feeling that probably, you know, scarred me for life or something. I you don't know? blame um, you. But I don't like being um, – it's also a claustrophobic thing, you know. It, I just don't like being – you know, kind of cooped up. You can't mm-hmm. go anywhere for so long. But and it, it, it turns out I, there's a lot of places I like to go, but I don't go. I take the train a lot, um, but okay. uh, which is really a nice way to travel. But um, I wish I could get over it somehow. To tell you the truth, you know, I've I had some clients that when they had these weird fears and phobias, sometimes believe it or not, uh, when they experienced their first time, they had a dip in their sugar levels, which mm-hmm. made them feel really bad. And somewhere, why the brain does this that bad feeling in their body they connected to what they were doing and sometimes it depends if it was early morning usually when people have sugar dips yep your brain yeah, makes I, this weird <laughs> yes and people have told me that they said that you know, you're you're afraid of flying because of something that happened something mm-hmm. different had happened in you and, yeah. and you're relating it to having to do with flying we yes. lived near an airport when i was growing up in boston and jets were going over all the time like late at night and they'd be so loud you couldn't talk, you know. As a little kid, that can kind of scare you because, you know, sure. it's almost like they're going to crash into your house. Well, you you might connect that feeling to it like sure. something happened earlier that day. And, yeah, yeah, that's uh, – yeah, I've been told that. So, you know. Yeah. And somewhere somewhere, your mind made that connection and it right. stuck. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. it's like, yeah. And, I mean, you probably could be hypnotized out of it, like you said, because sometimes <laughs> it's like – like the same thing I had when I had clients that were afraid to get in the elevator. It makes mm-hmm. getting to work or certain places really tough. Or either that or they were afraid to, of going in alone. They had to always, in other words, have somebody traveling in the elevator with them. So Right, right. Going over bridges too is another thing. Yes. You know, I know a lot of people don't like going over bridges even though, yeah. you know, it's 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 kind of like um, – it's an unnatural fear because, you know, but you just don't like to be up there high and, and, uh, yeah, like I don't, I'm not crazy about bridges either. You know, I'm always thinking at the top, well, this is, if it's going to collapse, it'll collapse now when I'm on it. So. You're right. Exactly. Yeah. Great timing on my part. A lot of it, believe it or not, is just tied back into anxiety and uh-huh. self-soothing. And it's like, Oh, that's a whole different thing. But yeah. Yeah. I, I've heard of that where people got to get this little group of things that make them, different levels of anxiety like i can handle it or there's no way i'm going to do that right i I'll t- i have to tell you the story real quick i was on amtrak i take amtrak to florida all the time because uh, we have relatives down there mm-hmm. and i was taking a amtrak 
uh, to uh, Boynton Beach, which is kind of close to Miami, you mm-hmm. know, the Fort Lauderdale area around there. Right. And the train was stalled for an hour because an airplane crashed in the tracks about two miles in front of us. <laughs> You're I'm kidding. thinking, well, wouldn't that be the ironic thing if the airplane crashed into the train? Right. Because like... yeah, I'm afraid of flying. In the afterlife, you would have said, I knew it. I knew it. I knew it. it. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway. I knew it was got to have something to do with an airplane. <laughs> Right, and that's so, very unusual, like you said, because you've written, you have so many books that mm-hmm. have to do with planes. Fine. I mean, oh yeah, yeah, all of them. I mean, all like forty of them. How many I've written? They all have some kind of an aviation, you know, theme to them. And yes. it's like the guy who the guy who designs the greatest roller coasters in the world. He won't get on them. You know, he doesn't yeah. like to ride roller coasters, yet he's famous for, you know, designing all these crazy roller coasters at Six Flags and stuff. So I, I, I feel that. like I'm kind of like him. You know? That makes sense. Sometimes, yeah. like you said, when you know too much about the mechanics of something. You don't want to go near it. You realize, man, if people only knew. Right. Exactly. So, and this, even though, you know, I know they, they have all these different figures that you're more, more likely to have an accident in a vehicle, but I'm thinking to myself, yeah, you could survive it, but let's face it. You know, one time I did the, uh, I was looking at that there was out, you know, out west of Miami, out in the Everglades, we've had three major airplane crashes. Mm-hmm. Sure. Um, a lot of people don't realize that there was back one out in the 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, it's like that, you know the one of them the flight 401 did have survivors but let's face it in the in more than likely if you're involved in an airplane crash you're not going right. to survive you're not going to survive right you're not gonna and, survive. And, and, but it's, it is very safe i mean there's 40,000 airplanes take off and land every day around the world mm-hmm. and and you know you really don't hear of any really big crashes anymore you know back no. in the 60s and everything when the technology was different you did, but now it is. It's it's just very safe, and it's it's safer than driving a car. There's no doubt about it. But it's the idea, or at least for someone like me, is that of of just being up there, cooped up, not being able to go anywhere. If I was able to go in the cockpit and you know take over the controls myself, I'd feel better. You know, as crazy <laughs> as that is, but I, I just don't like that 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 feeling, and that's what a lot of people don't like flying. They, yeah. they agree with me. It's like the more cooped up aspect that bothers me. I know, I know. It's 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 a. Let me ask you: Do you have problems being the passenger in the vehicle or riding in the back seat? Um, <laughs> gee whiz! Don't <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>, worry. <laughs> I've never had that question. I've never had that question. Um, I, I I don't you know I don't I don't really like driving to tell you the truth you know mm-hmm. uh, I don't like driving long distances that's for sure because I get bored you know I get right. antsy is is really what it's about I know, you know? I know no the reason why I asked is when you said that okay you know like if they could let me in the cockpit and I feel better it's like right. oh I know I've run across this is like if I have to I'll drive I'll drive I'll, but yes right right <laughs> if I had a business if I had my own jet my own private jet I don't think it would bother me as much you know. Because I figured, well, you know, in the, the worst case scenario, I could go and try to take the c- controls and try to be in control. That's another thing, as people say, is, yes. you know, you want to, f- you feel like you, you're not in control when you're flying in an airplane. Yes, and, exactly. exactly. And I know that feeling. That's a real anxious feeling. Yes, yes, I know. So let me ask you, with this thing with um, with uh, the UFOs and as far as with wartime and everything, I know that a lot of people out there have this magical thinking that they're thinking that if we ever got to the point in wartime of extinction, nuclear war, all the, mm-hmm. you know, using, uh, but if they think that the ETs are going to step in and save the day. Right. Do you think uh, that that's a possibility or they're going to go, well, too bad? Well, you know, usually I'm like a bucket of cold water and stuff like that. But uh-huh. I, I will tell you this is in, in UFOs and wartime, we have two like extensive chapters about what happened around U.S. ICBM bases in the late 60s and the 70s, where, you know, and there's been, like I say, entire books written about this, but there's no doubt about it that, you know, throughout the 70s that there were lots of UFO sightings around our ICM, ICBM bases in the middle part of the country. Okay. Now, these are places where, you know, the missiles are like literally miles apart, and they're, they're out in Montana and South Dakota where it's nothing mm-hmm. but just flat territory. And and there's documented evidence that not only would these UFOs like show up at certain times, but when they would fly over one of these launch um, you know facilities, right? Uh, they would they would turn off the power. They would they would you know realign the targeting. They would they would knock off 
thousands of our ICBMs at any given time. That's that's our that's the that's like our last, uh, you know, that's our last defense, you know. And to, yes, yes. And, to, and, and this went on for forever. And um, I get it, you know, I always kind of give props to Peter Jennings because about two years before he died, he did a three-hour special on ABC News uh-huh. about UFOs, and it's like the most. It's like the most comprehensive thing you will ever see on, you know, like our kind of media. And he really got into this. And he said, well, what were they doing? You know, and and everyone said, it seems like they were trying to tell us that we can change our technology. We can retarget these missiles. We can mm-hmm. we can have a control over your most, you know, the, the, the thing that is most important to your defense. And the thing right. is, is that it happened in Russia, too. That you know oh. they would see UFOs over these ICBM bases in the Ukraine and and so on. It was happening to them too. So once again, it's 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 a mystery. But but you know when you think about it, it's almost like they're saying, okay, you know we know what you got here. Here's yes. a little hint to tell you that you know we can turn it on and turn it off anytime we want. Exactly, and and um. And, and it makes you even wonder, what if they do have installations here that it's like, we don't really care about the humans, but we have some uh, bases and things that we really don't want to have uh, blown mm-hmm. up or contaminated or whatever the case might be. I mean, well, the, 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 you know, and uh, I'm, I'll tell the story uh, again. You know, I don't believe anything happened in Roswell, and I, a lot of people like get on my case about that, but I really don't. Okay. Uh, but there is a story about um, an ICBM base where – it was so "quote unquote" haunted that even when they were building it, UFOs would show up to the point where the MPs would not go out and guard the construction at what? night because some okay because so many UFOs would show up and they would call jets and the UFOs would take off and then the jets would leave and the UFOs would come back and that base <laughs> that ICBM base is in Roswell, New Mexico. That's the real Roswell story. Okay, that there was a haunted ICBM base there. Uh, to the point where the government actually went in and investigated what the heck was going on. Uh-huh. I mean, MPs, MPs would not go out there at night. Okay, you know that speaks it, volumes it, it, right there. It's right down the street from where you know they supposedly you know found all this uh, crash debris. Mm-hmm. That's the that's the st- real story of Roswell. Look into that. Take the time and the effort of looking into that instead of you know what was most likely a weather balloon, and you might actually come up with something. Well, yeah, I've heard in some cases that. The Roswell incident is like a red herring, like, okay, pay attention to that. So you really don't look at what's you, really going well, on. It's that. And it's also, it's been an excuse for people to write lots of books and to be on TV and to give mm-hmm. lectures and everything. And where it gets to the point where, you know, some book said that, well, 25 UFOs crashed at Roswell and we have 50. But it's like, well, you know, after the third or fourth crash don't you think they would avoid roswell you know because they say yeah, somebody's going to crash exactly. there you know uh, it's it's a way you know I, I just don't believe any of it i mean one of the, one of the things that people always kind of leave out in these stories about roswell is that you know a, a, a good amount of rope and scotch tape was found <laughs> among the debris okay? really i never heard it, that Okay, and and you know, let's face it. You know, if this was some kind of a flying saucer, you were for whatever, they yeah. wouldn't be using rope or scotch tape. I hope not. Um, <laughs> you know, so uh, you know, I know I, I would actually like to go down there because I know it's kind of like a party every week down there, mm-hmm. and it's a tourist <laughs> attraction and so on. But like I say, the real story is about forty miles up the street at this ICBM base there that was so haunted, no one wanted to go out at night. You know, that's pretty strange. Yeah, that meant that something was happening all the time. Right, exactly. Yep. yep. Yeah, and the, I bet some of those MPs or soldiers were thinking, man, I don't want to get abducted. Forget right. it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, they were afraid of it. So, uh, interesting. Very interesting. Well, Mac, thank you so much for spending this time today. I have thought it's so, so interesting. You said you also, you uh, you have a show. Where What... Uh, when do you have that show airing? As far as do you talk about the UFOs or? Mm-hmm. It's it's called Mac Maloney's Military X Files, mm-hmm. where we talk about um, you know uh, the military and UFOs and how they kind of intersect. Uh, okay. We're on the Inception Radio Network. We're on uh, Doc Matter Radio Network. Mm-hmm. We're on the Military Appreciation Appreciation Channel, which uh, supplies programming to. Um, um, Radio Free Europe and um, the Armed Forces Radio, I should say. So a lot okay. of veterans listen in on our show. 
Okay. We have a good time, and uh, you know, just uh, Google us, and you'll find us eventually. Yeah, believe me, I'm sure there's plenty of things to talk over and over. And mm-hmm. I mean, things are get get dismissed. Other things happened. Um, people right. open their minds to other possibilities of what their origins are, mm-hmm. including I've heard. I know you've heard the that they're us. In other words, they're time travelers. Yes. Right. Sure. Yeah. I I, I think there's a lot of evidence to that. I really do. I mm-hmm. think that. That, you know, that if you had the ability, if we live 500 years from now or 5,000 years from now, and you had the ability to be a time tourist, to go back and see, you know, how yeah. a war was fought, how the siege of Troy, you know, someone said to me the other day, I'd come back and, and see a Shakespeare play, you know, yes. there's a lot of parallax stuff, you know, that, that you know, we, we can't really figure out, like if people, some people say, I'd like to. I'd go back. I want to be present at the crucifixion. Well, why aren't there a million people at the yes. crucifixion? So there's stuff like that, you know, that has to be kind of explained. But the idea that they just kind of are looking in on us as history is being made, you know, there's a really good case for that. I believe so. I mean, that that I, if as being as human, exactly what you said, if time travel was possible. Uh, you would have probably a full ship all the time, like, oh, I want to go back and right. see what happened, whatever. You know, here we are, but we might be talking thousands of years in the future as far as where mm-hmm. we're at. Ah, you want to go back to the home base, the real, the old time, you know, way back where we came from? You know, of course, you know. Yeah, who but wouldn't? why not? No. Why not? Maybe that's, that's where it is. And here we're going round and round pulling our hair out, trying to figure out who E.T. really is. Right. Again, thank you so much, Mac. It has been wonderful to have you. I'm going to include a credit to your show here in the credits of the show, the the link. And uh, thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Well, it's great talking to you. Thanks for inviting me. And uh, hopefully we'll talk soon, okay? Absolutely. My pleasure. Take care. Okay. Thank you, Marlene. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. So, guys, what did you think? I loved it. What can I say? It's all about the ETs. No. Really, you know what? I'm going to tell you why. There's just so many theories out there. And, you know, yes, there's people that have mental illness and they hallucinate up. Yes. There's people that are lying. Yes. There's people that see something they believe is real, but it isn't. Yes. But that still leaves so many incidents described. And you, you know what? And everybody says, well, because if it's military or police, there's a lot of people that are not military, not police, not trained observers. But that doesn't mean that they don't have too good pair of eyes and are skeptics. And like he said, usually this happens when you're not looking for it to happen. And they have, they see something. They see something. And they're like, they're probably, as a matter of fact, there's a lot of these people that are wanting to identify it as something human origin as in the weather balloon a plane uh whatever and they can't they 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 go through this list and then they're faced with that moment of oh god this is not a plane this is not a helicopter this is not anything i can account for okay i am looking at a ufo and this is the interesting thing, which is what Mac and me were talking about was, you know, this recent disclosure that they did now in um, in December of 2017, that they admitted to funding a program to look at all these sightings of UFOs. As in, are we talking ET? Are we talking man-made, but is somebody out there got, because of the way these things move. And we were thinking, okay, why now? Is it just coincidental or is there, or we are at the edge of the precipice. We just don't know that we're at the edge of the precipice as far as discoveries and admissions about uh, life from other planets, other galaxies, being either here, observing us, uh, or in some cases, there's people that believe that they've given us technology or that there's even hybrids of humans and extraterrestrials, that there's more than one extra. I mean, this the ramifications on this could go so many ways. 
And I still subscribe to my original idea, which is I think that despite, you know, what you see um, with the X-Files, which, you know, the, the main theme of the X-Files has always been that there's this huge uh, plan that the government has had with ETs. Mm, I think sometimes it's like what Mac was saying at the very beginning. There might be more that they don't know than what they do know. And if they ever admit it, if something just happened, that that's it. They, 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 they can't be denied anymore. Of course, they're going to be flooded with questions. What are they? Where do they come from? What do they want? Blah, blah, blah. I mean, <laughs> the questions would be endless. Can you imagine what position the government would be in whatever government, whether it's the United States or any other government? Let's face it, at some point, all the governments are going to be having to answer these questions, even if one admits it, because we all live on the same planet. And they would have to say, we don't know. 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 If you don't think there's be a lot of people, especially the ones that have always believed it, but have always thought that there was this big integration between these extraterrestrials and the government of whatever, and come to find out that they don't. Wow. Wow. I'm telling you, a lot of people, and maybe I'm being um, overly dramatic, but I don't. Uh, I don't know if you all, some of you I'm sure remember when the year 2000 was coming about. And they had all these end of the world movies like Final uh, Impact or whatever. And uh, one of the fears that they had about the one, you know, with the meteor coming and hitting Earth was because of the fact that they couldn't save anybody was that economies and societies would collapse because people would stop going to work. People would stop paying their bills. People would just stop following the rules, the law. It'd be a free-for-all because now this is not the same as in there's a meteor coming into Earth and it's going to possibly wipe out most of the life form on there. But if you don't think that, especially here in the United States, where we have laws and society and everything, people go to work, wake up next day, send your kids to school, whatever, whatever's going on with you. If you don't think that the admission, first of all, of extraterrestrials coming to Earth, whatever. But the government's having to admit that they know, in fact, very little about them. That perhaps all the information they have is what's been captured off of planes, all these, you know, uh, objects that are flying in at certain speeds that are, we don't know how we, they do it. Or even more, besides the fact is how do they get here? That Yeah, that's like, everybody would be like, what? You know, there's going to be the doomsday sayers. They're coming. They're going to enslave us. Um, you know, everybody would remember every movie that there is out there about ETs and UFOs, Independence Day. Oh, they wipe War of the Worlds. <laughs> you know, yeah, you could think of the one, uh, Counters of the Third Kind, the one that came out in the 70s where... You know, they, they kind of traded, we kind of traded, um, we kind of traded species, you know, it was, it was very interesting. Also, how would we communicate? Uh, yeah, I'm telling you, there'd be a lot of people, a good majority of people worldwide that would have a hard time wrapping their heads around that. As far as how do I go back to live my life the way I used to before I had this knowledge, before I realized that even my government or the people that uh, are supposed to take care of this, just maybe know a little bit more than I do. Is it nothing? I'm telling you, that's why I, I think that as far as how they handle this, uh, despite, you know, Hollywood acclimating us kind of in a way to ETs, it was like we said, back in the 50s and 60s, it was the Cold War. That's why they had all these flying saucer movies and was that fear of the Cold War. But Cold War has been over. Well, at least that Cold War has been over for a while. Okay, Berlin Wall fell. But I'm telling you, there's a big, 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 huge difference 
between what you either totally deny ex exists or that you kind of believe it could be possible, but either you haven't seen an ET or UFO, you're, you're open to it. Yeah, like, man, I can't believe that nobody, no other planet has life. And even if you're one of these people, I'm not even going to say an abductee, I'm not even going to go that far. But let's say you're one of these people that has seen, genuinely believes that they have seen a UFO. Okay. And there's an admission that they are here, that they have been here, are here, whatever. And that there's so much that we don't know about. I'm telling you. Whoa. Our society would change, despite what everybody thinks. It would totally change. Because all of a sudden, we would be taken out of being the center of it all. It's all about us. To, oh, wait a minute. We're really just truly living on this little planet. And as important as we are to this planet and ourselves, and uh, wow, we might be just a speck with some carbon-based uh, life on it. Mm. So yeah, that's really interesting. I hope, I believe I would be alive to see this. I hope to be alive, and I believe I will be alive to see when we finally reach Mars. And makes you wonder, you know, what, what's going to happen with us? What's going to happen with the human species? I mean, let's face it, within, what, the last hundred years, our technology has cut, it's grown by leaps and bounds. And, you know, there's a lot of people out there that say that, Mankind's advances are due to interaction with extraterrestrials. Could be, could be just that we're real smart, and it was just uh, something like, you know, we reached critical mass when it came to inventions, the industrial revolution, etc. But anyway, a lot of mysteries, guys. A lot of mysteries. A lot of frontiers out there, uh, as far as exploration is concerned, whether it's physical exploration. Or whether it's science, I mean, interdimensional travel, I mean, possibilities are endless. So anyway, guys, I hope you enjoyed this show. I know I love uh, speaking with Matt. Um, I'm hoping to bring on more people that deal with the UFO, ufologists, uh, extraterrestrials. There's a lot of schools of beliefs out there. Um, and um, like I said, that is part of the paranormal because right now it's not normal. <laughs> So anyway, guys, I hope you like this show. Please hit the subscribe button, whether you're watching the video on YouTube or you're catching me on any of the podcast platforms. That This way you get notified when I release a show. Also, one of the advantages is that you can download the MP3 file and listen to it at your leisure, which I know from personal experience that sometimes that's the best, easiest way for me to listen to things because sometimes we have crazy schedules and it's just easier to download a show and then listen to it you know and for my true believers don't forget to send me your stories i look forward to receiving more stories go to miamighostchronicles.com go to the submit your story tab there's ways different ways that we can get together whether you want to send it to me or while i interview you whichever you prefer and uh catch me on facebook and on twitter i live stream there a lot got some fantastic guests coming on i'm telling you I'm going far and wide to bring the most interesting people out there, authors, experts, just so we could talk about, you know, their own personal experiences, in this case, what they write about, and uh, what they believe is going to be happening, and whatever their field of uh, interest is. So guys, thank you so much. It has been wonderful, and you're all wonderful. Take care.